Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Caper from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, we have a, a reading and a sermon that I'm going to relate to the subject of anxiety today. And uh, our Bible reading is from Philippians 3, 2 through 11. Mm. Paul says to the church in Philippi, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators in the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me then, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. This is the word of the Lord, my friends. It could be anything. My church has a big photocopier printer. Well, my church has a new youth pastor. How many attend your worship service? We did three baptisms last month. When pastors meet, we tend to sort ourselves out a bit, gauge who is being successful and who isn't, figure out who is in the same boat so we can commiserate, tell each other we're really okay. It's a sign of pride. It's a sign of anxiety. And really, the two go together. Famed psychologist Alfred Adler said that feelings of superiority, i.e. pride, always mask feelings of inferiority, always. The prideful, egotistical person is always a scared, insecure person on the inside. I don't want to overstate this because they manifest so very differently. It's, it's just very different to be in a room with a narcissistic demagogue than it is to share space with a shy person afraid to voice an opinion. You know, looking back on some historical works, I note that theologians and preachers used to talk more about pride. Some called it the cardinal sin. It is bad for oneself because it isn't able to accurately assess what is going on in life. It's bad for others because the proud person winds up bullying people around them, abusing their authority and strength as they demean others to try and keep them lower. But I've noticed a shift. Now people speak about anxiety far more often. We apparently live in an anxious age, or at least we talk about it that way. At least people wanting reassurance. It, is it just me who feels this way? I feel scared and nervous all the time. And they post about their fears on social media. Well, no, it isn't just you. There are plenty of reasons to feel anxious. <laughs> in addition to whatever's going on in your own life, is COVID, polarization, inflation, war, global warming. And one can hardly blame people for being afraid of those things. I'm afraid of them. But I am more interested at the personal level this morning. Probably you've heard of a thing called imposter syndrome. It seems to affect more recent generations more than older ones, and women more often than men. And what happens is that really gifted, talented, hardworking people say they feel like imposters and fear that others will discover that they are not who they present as. 
It's a particularly insidious form of anxiety and an interesting example of the larger phenomena I'm describing. Well, ultimately you get tired of feeling anxious and maybe you decide to do something about it. And if your goal is something really concrete, like I wanna to learn to drive or I wanna learn a little Spanish or I'm gonna read the gospel of Mark, then that's fine. Those are straightforward goals that you may well achieve through honest effort. But if you wanna feel different, what kind of an effort brings that about? Or if you want to achieve some goal that involves radical change at many levels, like, I don't know, overcoming alcoholism or another addiction, well, that's an entirely different kind of change. We are born fallen people in a fallen world. You, know, you can see the fallenness in the world all over. We say we hate war, but we fight many of them. And it's hard to believe in progress when deaths from opioids and gun violence are on the rise and life expectancy is declining in the United States. And honestly, a never, an ever increasing flood of self-help books doesn't seem to have helped all that much. Paul's message to the church in Philippi, like his message to the church in Galatia and the church in Corinth, says that we cannot solve our fundamental problems through our own efforts. Some people in those churches thought that you could. They thought if you ate the right foods, and kept the Sabbath in a certain way, and got circumcised, that this would save you from your problems. They thought that was the way forward. And Paul, as I said in a recent sermon, has this response, no, no, and no. He says about them, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Look, he says, I have more reason to be confident of my own works than any of them. Here I am, a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews, a Pharisee, uh, a zealous, uh, as to righteousness based on the law, faultless. But it was all rubbish, he says. It got me nothing. I was completely on the wrong track. It was a total waste of time. What I needed was Christ. Out of my own efforts, I got nothing. But in Christ, I have all. Not through my own works, but through faith. And then he declares his goal, his aim. I want to know Christ. He has to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Let's look at the verbs in those verses. The first verb is to know. To know what? To know the power of Christ's resurrection. It grounds us in the promise that our limitations, the crazy violence of the world and our anxiety about all of it, these are not all that there is. The things we are afraid of do not get the last word. Death does not get the last word. There is something beyond. There is resurrection, renewal, rebirth. But and here comes the part you don't want to hear. The second thing we are to know is fellowship with Christ's sufferings. We feel anxious, oppressed, afraid, discomforted, pain, trouble. Well, Jesus felt those things too. Feeling such things is a natural part of the human condition. We are neither the first nor the last to wrestle with them. Somehow, tolerating those feelings, perhaps accepting them, can draw us closer to Jesus and advance us along the path of spiritual growth. You know, as with most spiritual matters, talking about this is tricky. I'm not suggesting that you seek out suffering, but if your suffering draws you closer to Jesus, then perhaps it can work to your advantage. God does not promise that we will never suffer injury, anxiety, or death, but the message of the cross is that God redeems suffering. And this brings me to the second verb that Paul uses. In the translation I read, it was becoming like him in his death. Perhaps a better translation would be something more like conforming to the pattern of his death. A subtle distinction, but I think it involves an acceptance of our own eventual deaths and certainly our struggles. 
It is also a remembrance and a connection with the faith that Christ showed as his death approached. Neither opposition, nor insults, nor even beatings, nor even the cross caused him to lose his focus on God. There is here an invitation to focus on what is true, what is forward, what is positive. In fact, Paul says exactly that in the next chapter. Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Sometimes when considering one's negative feelings and problems, it's appropriate to consider one's past, one's family of origin, the trauma one has suffered and the like. If you've never have had a season where you have done that and you are wrestling with anxiety, it might be a good thing to do. But for those of us who have done that, be wary of getting stuck in that mode. It is possible to become paralyzed by one's past and to never move on from those learnings, to never really heal. Once you've made the rounds of your past life, look forward, look to Christ, consider his life, his ways, and how he faced death. Then if you conform to the pattern of Christ's death, you will also conform to the pattern of Christ's resurrection. And then you will see some changes. Feel anxious, uncertain if you are loved or lovable. If you know Christ, you begin to feel just how much you really are loved and treasured. Because whatever is loved is valued. And if you're valued by Christ, well, that is the real deal. Now we have a real reason for confidence. Not the fake confidence of pride, but real confidence in what is true, and real, and lovely. And then you will no longer need to judge others in order to make yourself feel better. You won't need to put others down to try and raise yourself up. One author describes pride this way. Pride is not knowing who we really are. It is not letting God be God and letting people who, and letting people who God created them to be. That's the weird about that sentence. As a result, we overcompensate. We attempt to do what is not ours to do, and then judge those poorly who don't measure up. Listen, my friends, we cannot save ourselves. We are offered salvation through Christ as a free gift that we access through faith. But we are not done when we realize that. We are just beginning. We will still wrestle with troubles, including our own feelings of anxiety, but we will do so as Christian people who look to Jesus, and the Spirit will be with us as we advance in the journey of faith. And then we are freed to pursue the life of love, to love others, and to do good things in the world. Believe it or not, I'm going to give the last word to Pope Francis. I found a terrific quote of his about anxiety that I wanted to share with you. Here we go. Keep following your hopes and dreams. Be careful about one temptation that can hold us back. It is anxiety. Anxiety can work against us by making us give up whatever we do not see instant results. Our best dreams are only attained through hope, patience, and commitment, and not in haste. At the same time, we should not be hesitant, afraid to take chances or make mistakes. Avoid the paralysis of the living dead who have no life because they are afraid to take risks, to make mistakes, or to persevere in their commitments. Even if you make mistakes, you can always get up and start over, for no one has the right to rob you of hope. Amen, Pope Francis. Indeed, our hope in Christ is secure. Amen.